Another important thing is a bacterial meningitis score. So we have five parameters in bacterial meningitis score. We have a gram stain. If it is positive, we give two points for that. CSF WBC, so cell count more than 1000 cells per ml, proteins more than 80 and uh, ANC or absolute neutrophil count in the peripheral blood, not CSF, ANC in the peripheral blood more than 10,000 cells per ml and a history of seizure before presentation. They are each given one point. So we have two points for gram stain, one each for pleocytosis, proteins, ANC more than 10,000 and seizure. So we calculate the total score. If the score is two points or more, bacterial meningitis is highly likely. The thing is, it has a 99.9% .9 negative predictive value in the diagnosis of bacterial meningitis. So if your score is less than 2, you can easily exclude a bacterial meningitis. Next comes the neuroimaging, which is discussed that prior to performing an LP, we should always go in for a CT scan if your patient presents with neurological symptoms like seizures or focal neurological deficits and so on and so forth. So neuroimaging has a very important role to play in patients with meningitis. CT scan is a simpler investigation, quick to carry out, widely available, easy to interpret, but MRI brain is the ideal neuroimaging that should be done because it gives you much, much more information about the type of meningitis. So what are the characteristic neuroimaging changes that may be seen? Very important. In herpes simplex encephalitis, there may be frontotemporal changes. Very important. Then in TBM, you may have basal exudates on a contrast CT or a contrast MRI. So there are a lot of basal exudates. You may see ring enhancing lesions called tuberculomas in contrast CT or contrast MRI. Then in Japanese encephalitis, you may see thalamic and midbrain changes. In toxoplasmosis, you may see lesions in the basal ganglia. So this scan I wanted to show you for herpes encephalitis. So there is frontotemporal involvement, which is very characteristic of herpes encephalitis. This is a scan for a tubercular meningitis. So you have a lot of basal exudates in here. Next, coming on to electroencephalography or EEG. Now, EEG is strongly recommended in any suspected case of acute encephalitis because patients who have a cortical ir irritation, who have a brain parenchymal involvement, they present with seizures. So, EEG is strongly recommended in them because altered sensorium may be caused because of non-convulsive seizures. So, EEG would help you to distinguish focal encephalitis from generalized encephalopathy. Focal encephalitis. How do they present? HSV encephalitis. I'll tell you, there are 2 to 3 hertz periodic lateralized epileptiform discharges originating from the temporal lobes. We just discussed that viral encephalitis has a frontotemporal involvement. So there would be lateralized epileptiform discharges orig originating from these temporal lobes. And they may be typical of HSV. As against a generalized encephalopathy, where there is a diffuse bihemispheric slowing, like the triphasic slow waves seen in hepatic encephalopathy. So carry out an EEG if you suspect that the patient has a poor sensorium because of seizures. This was about the workup and evaluation. Next, we proceed on to the most important aspect of meningitis encephalitis and that is the management. Now, I just told you meningitis encephalitis are infectious neurological emergencies and they need to be promptly manage, managed. So first is the golden hour management. What do you need to do when a patient comes to you in triage immediately? You need to do the ABC as you do for all patients. So look at the airway, whether it is patent or not, you may give supplemental oxygen. If the saturations are low, you may go ahead, intubate the patient with rapid sequence induction. If the patient is unable to protect the airway or his GCS is low. Next is blood glucose that we need to do promptly. We need to see the vitals. And then we need to see the GCS. What is the GCS of the patients? These are the four things that you need to look in with equal priority at the top. ABCs, blood glucose, vitals and GCS. Appropriate fluid resuscitation needs to be carried out as a part of the C in ABC. And then after you have resuscitated the patient, what should be your steps? The first thing should be giving parenteral antibiotics. Now this needs to be clarified to each one of you that you give parenteral antibiotic before you do an LP, before you perform a CT scan, 
because it is a neurological emergency. You are not waiting for any tests to return apart from a blood glucose. You are not waiting for any CSF analysis picture. You are not waiting for any CT scan. You are straight away giving a parenteral antibiotic. I will tell you why in the subsequent slides. So parenteral antibiotics have to be started immediately in cases with clinical suspicion of meningitis without waiting for brain imaging or LP. Now which antibiotics are to be given? There are three major characteristics. Please remember the parenteral antibiotics that be given meningitis should hit hard and hit fast. Now hit hard means they should be bactericidal. So please give bactericidal antibiotics only. Don't go in for any bacteriostatic drugs. So bactericidal antibiotic, you have to hit hard and hit fast. So fast, I just discussed, you have to immediately administer these antibiotics and hit hard with bactericidal antibiotics, which have a reasonable CSF penetration and a broad spectrum. So you are covering both gram positive and as well as gram negative organisms because you really don't know what might be the cause for this meningitis at this point of time. A quick shot of IV dexamethasone 10 milligram precedes the initiation of antibiotics. So please remember steroid, if, it, if, if you think you need to give a steroid, give it before you administer your antibiotic. So let me just remind you the stepwise manage of, management of meningitis. The first step is steroid and not antibiotic. So before administering your antibiotic, give a shot of steroids. Second step is empiric antibiotics. The third step is imaging, shift the patient for a CT scan. Fourth step is lumbar puncture, going for a CSF analysis. And fifth step is management of any complications that are present. So please remember this sequence, steroids, empiric antibiotics, imaging, lumbar puncture, and finally management of complications.